he isn't as crazy as people are making him out to be, I don't think. Yeah, he's still kind of crazy. We may have disagreements on this show. Yeah, you think? All right, everyone, welcome back to the Loopcast, where we talk faith, culture, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Today, it is me, Erica, and Josh. Interesting week for Democrats, to say the least. We have a contender now, potentially, in RFK Jr. He just did. For the first time, he said in 18 years, he was able to give his full case, full case for a vision for the country, a lot of the work that he's done. The first person to let him speak is Joe Rogan, and you might see him on the thumbnail coming soon, but Joe Rogan, of all people, gave him the platform to finally get out his points, and once the G is out of the bottle, there's no going back. So I want to give a little bit of a timeline of why this was such a controversial interview. For those that maybe weren't following it as closely, this is a really big deal for a lot of reasons. So starting uh, RFK Jr., he is the son of Bobby Kennedy. He is the nephew of John F. Kennedy, uh, both of whom were assassinated. And he comes from a long line of a political elite family. And so he started off his career as an environmental lawyer going after environmentalist causes And he has kind of taken his career in the direction of pursuing what Mercury does uh, in terms of their role for health. And so he, uh, of course, has been very critical of big pharmaceutical companies, what's going on in vaccines. And that is considered uh, conspiratorial by a lot of people. So he's been completely banished from polite society for a good 18, 20 years, not allowed to talk. Whenever he does talk, his stuff gets yanked down. He's censored everywhere. So for the first time, in his, in his words, in 18 years, he was able to go on a program, talk for three and a half hours, give his full story. He's also running for president as a Democrat, of course, coming from well, a long line of thing. Democrats. Yeah, I, I, think, I honestly think he, he announced that he's running for president precisely because it gives him a greater opportunity to get back on platforms like Instagram. Right, and I, I think it's but a, part it's a of smart the, move. Part of the trick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really smart move, but this is kind of revealed now that he's been able to come out and speak uh, in a full segment, he isn't as crazy as people are making him out to be, I don't think. Or at least he yeah. isn't deserving of he isn't deserving of complete censorship. Uh, okay, I, I mean, he's, yeah, he's slightly less crazy. I mean, I don't know. He's still kind of crazy. <laughs> we may have disagreements on this show, but he was able yeah, to first think? give... <laughs> 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 he was able to finally give his full piece. And so the, the, what happened directly after was uh, Joe Rogan had also interviewed this guy, uh, Dr. Peter Hotez, he is a PhD. He was kind of a media darling during 20, 20 21, 22, uh, going on MSNBC, going on CNN, pretty much anywhere he could go, he's on 24-7, talking about, uh, he actually started off uh, testifying in front of Congress saying that the Emergency Use Authorization Act shouldn't be used for the vaccine. That was when Trump was in office during Operation Warp Speed, and then quickly changed his tune as uh, Trump left office and Biden got in office, all of a sudden saying, yep, everyone should get it. Uh, the goalpost really moved a bunch of times, but uh, there's a lot of very public contradictions in what he's been saying. And he kind of threw the first shot across the bow saying, and, and I have the tweet in front of me. This is on a Tucker Carlson episode on Twitter. I'm quite concerned about the Elon Tucker link, then fold in Rogan and RFK Jr. And it becomes a pretty formidable coalition with neo-fascist leanings in some ways darker or perhaps more dangerous than Trump, in my opinion, awful. I just hope Team Biden is preparing. And so from that, Joe Rogan, who also had him on his show, uh, offered him $100,000 to come on to debate RFK Jr. And the total tally of money that is put up to conduct this debate is about $2.6 million now. Because all going to charity. All going all, to charity. All for charity of his choice, of Hotez's choice. Because people would like to see someone publicly debate RFK Jr. Because it's never happened. And uh, he's given a lot of non-answers as to why he's not going to come on. But uh, this has become just a huge conversation about... Uh, it's opened up old wounds, I think, from the past three years for a lot of people in terms of trusting the experts and not talking to the common man. Um, and also not treating a presidential candidate with the proper, you know, exposure and respect that I think any other candidate receives. So, uh, do we have any quick th- thoughts on this situation, guys? Well, I mean, well, the left it's is kind of fun. T- mm. Go ahead, Josh. I defer, to, I defer I lo- to Erica. I was going to say I'd like to hear Erica first because I know Josh has very strong thoughts. So the leftist media jumps on this, right? And not just media, but influencers. So we get comments like, "No uh, serious scientist should ever debate these points." 
science is not up for debate, I believe, as Peter Host has his own uh, own thing. And and I think that they're completely missing the point here. And again, we're probably going to disagree on RFK Jr. and just how crazy he is. His Many of his claims are probably wrong. But part of the reason he he even has a platform and he's generating this kind of interest, one, because Rogan gave it to him, but it's because we're at a point in a society post-COVID when a lot of these major ma- major medical healthcare figures, including Peter Hotez, who's now like, well, I won't debate it because he's not a peer-reviewed expert or something. Um, we're at this point where people, people like Hotez and Dr. Fauci, people at the CDC and on and on, they made it a public platform issue. They came on news shows. They came on Rachel Maddow. They came on and they they brought all of these, you know, you have to take the vaccine. Mask mandates work. We have to keep the schools shut down because this is our medical opinion. They made it a matter of public debate when they brought it out for the last three years. And people really suffered at the hands of this overbearing elitist medical establishment coupled with big media and big government. And, you know, if you beat people over and over again with these contradictions like masks are bad, masks are good, masks don't help, vaccines are bad, vaccines are good, they're not that effective. I mean, uh, Konstantin Kissin, who has a, he's a comedian, but he's also a journalist and he's a, he's a public figure. He had this great um, Twitter thread and then it became an article in the tablet. It's why don't they believe us? He says, quote, you're struggling to understand where all this vaccine hesitancy comes from. Let me help you. And then he just goes through the history of the the last four years. Actually, really, it goes back to 2016 in England with Brexit and then the Trump campaign and then the COVID issue. And so when this this whole leftist reaction to the Rogan challenge, really, to get these to get RFK Jr. in a debate is like, oh, well, science shouldn't debate. It's complete idiocy. You can't you can't ignore the fact that people have been lied to and all these contradictions have been pouring out at us for four years and then say, but we're not going to debate it because the medical experts will just tell us what to do. That's right. my hot take. All right, Josh, that that was probably much more eloquent than I could have said it, Erica, but I agree with a lot of those points. Well, thank you. But we'll um, let Josh go because he is the eloquent among Josh. eloquence <laughs> upon the podcast. I don't know about that, but I mean, the thing is, this debate is sometimes dismissed as a very online debate, and there, that's kind of a double-edged sword. In one way, I know what they mean by a very online debate because it's like 90% of Americans are like, what are you talking about? Who, what, is, what is this? I have no idea. Um, and, and so it gets dismissed that way. Oh, it's just very, no one knows what you're talking about. This is just a Twitter for war, blah, 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 blah. There is an element of truth to that. There is though, of course, the point I'd like to make is that a lot of us are online, actually. A lot of us are reading and hearing about this stuff. And then we're passing it along to other people. And I mean, look, I think RFK is mostly nuts. Like some people appear like, oh, maybe he should be Trump's running mate. I'm like, really? This guy is like conspiracy theorist type guy and he's super environmental wacko and i mean he's, i'm sure he's with the left on all things like abortion i have not no interest in this guy just because on the a given issue like should we force every american to get vaccinated for this it's not even a vaccine right it's a medical experimental therapy, treatment co- yeah. <laughs> should we force people to do this like uh no we should it's hello are we have a we, this is a free country why would we force people no, no, no. I don't believe in that at all, especially since it's experimental, as you say. Um, but I would, I, I just, ve- I'm just very hesitant. I mean, R- RFK, uh, just, mm, you know, yeah, I, I'm not, I wouldn't want to debate him either just because it tends to be the case when you debate someone who's so I- invested in like, conspiracy theories, it's like they just keep rattling on and on and on. And, and they're, it's, it, you talk about tangents and going down rabbit holes. It's just like, what? I'd prefer to have two smart medical experts go at it. So if we had this, the, the, you know, as you say, this media darling expert, um, you know, have Cortez. someone. Yeah, I would rather have like Marty McCary. You know, he's actually my friend. He's the, he's the guy at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he's the one that was arguing very sensibly against, you know, forcing the mandates. He was against, you know, these harsh lockdowns. Uh, he was just posting just the other day, like, like how, because we wouldn't let, we, we, we didn't allow people to visit their dying 
uh, family members because of the COVID lockdowns that nurses would actually take, you know, uh, surgical gloves and fill them with water and set it on the patient's hand. So it made it feel like their family was there. I mean, you just you hear about these kind of things and you're like, my goodness. And he was someone who understands like Marty would be great at handling a debate like this. I'd much rather have him say, but then RFK and he gets out there and it, it, I mean, you get some wacky wild stuff and i'm like okay I, it feels like a big distraction i think well i think uh, hotez I, is equally wacky wild well, kind he's, of he's on the other end. For, for sure hotez is bought and paid for because he's received all kinds of money to do the gain of function research that we're going to talk about later that was very problematic he's received money from the bill gates foundation a lot of money he doesn't need to do this debate because he doesn't need the money he would actually lose money if he did this debate right now here's the thing i much prefer an idea where RFK can say, Junior can say, why isn't anyone debating me? This is baloney. You should debate me. You know, and someone hopefully maybe will. What I don't like is when major platforms like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, sense YouTube, censor him. The reason I have such a problem with that is like, if you think this guy is nuts and bonkers and spilling out a bunch of sewage and talking about all these lies, then refute him. You don't have to do it on a one-on-one -on -one debate, let's say on Joe Rogan, but you could just, why isn't anyone going out there and saying, here's why RFK Jr. is stupid and explain what it is, you know, and talk about it. Like you're, you're going to, the way to fight the untruths isn't to completely try to suppress it because then you, you make them into these online martyrs. You're like, ah, they're afraid to tell me the truth. What are they hiding? It's like, well, I mean, in some cases you're just, you're just crazy, <laughs> you know, so I, I much prefer to debate somebody. It doesn't even have to be, like I said, it doesn't have to be a one-on-one -on -one debate, but go out there and put out a YouTube video and say, this is why RFK is wrong on this issue. Do it. That would be so much better than suppressing thought, suppressing ideas, kicking people off platforms. Fight the, fight the lies with truth. That's the best way to do it. Well, Amen. to RFK Jr.'s point, the reason he's kicked off of all of these places is because Big Farm... Big pharmaceutical companies in America are allowed to advertise. Uh, we're one of two countries that allow that. And they have so much control over content because they pay a lot of advertising money. So if someone wants to debunk that, go for it. But I think um, some of the really interesting thing points that he brought up that I think actually could make a really potent political coalition, coalition is he, his, he laid out the, the collaboration between the CDC, the NIH, the FDA, and a lot of big pharmaceutical companies. And I think a lot of people who have two eyes and saw what happened over the three, last three years saw how much money went to these places and are, they are still receiving a lot of the corruption involving Dr. Fauci. There's no question that Dr. Fauci lied repeatedly to the American public. He uh, definitely did fund gain-of-function research that led to the creation of this. Um, it's, it's all out there at this point. Uh, so there's that problem. He also talked about how much of a problem the military industri industrial complex is right now. And I think a lot of people feel that as well. Like how much money is going overseas to fight wars or to, to contribute to wars that we'd be much better off bringing to peaceful resolutions. And I think when people see that, you know, their neighbors, maybe how bad inflation is hurting people when they go to their grocery store or whatever, that actually is like a really potent populist message that I think could be really problematic for other Democrats on the ticket that are super pro war, super pro pharma. Like that to me is is Here's a, a little sticking history point for, for you, Tom. Time. Here's a little history for you though. The warning of the military industrial complex. Where where does that phrase come from? Do you know? I do not. Come on, brother. This is why we keep you around. <laughs> There are some underrated speeches in uh, U.S. history. Some are very highly rated and deserve to be so, like Gettysburg Address. But there's some that are like very kind of forgotten about for a reason. And uh, President Eisenhower's farewell address is a speech that everyone should read again. It's amazing. And he warns about this. He warns about the military-industrial complex. This conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, and even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. So, wow. I mean, he's, 
he he said it out there. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen, citizenry can compel the proper meshing of a huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. So, Thanks, Ike. And he, <laughs> and he warned. He warned about a scientific technological elite. I mean, just like, you know, Eisenhower, very underrated man. Yeah. All right. Homework for the Loopcast. Go read the address. Go look at President Eisenhower. Um, but yeah, I think those are, are completely runaway. And I think that uh, candidates that take advantage of that, I think that's why Trump was so popular and successful is he called out uh, all of the waste that happened in Afghanistan. Way too many Americans died there. Way too much money went there for it to just be destabilized and basically proxy of Iran now. So I'm curious what that message does to Democrats, you know, because he is running on a Democrat ticket. Will that even land or is he just going to continue to be you know, this conspiracy theorist that picks up no traction in the Democrat Party. Is he the well, Democratic I mean, look, Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, um, you know, if RFK Jr. shocks the world and gets like 35, 40% in the first prime, I don't know if they're doing the New Hampshire as the first primary, if it's not going to be South Carolina, I can't remember how the Democrats are doing that, but... um. I, I just don't, I mean, there's no way all of a sudden RFK Jr. becomes the nominee and everyone r rallies behind him because um, the, the Democrats in charge would be like, what? I, th I mean, we still need to remember like how powerful the, Dem I mean, the Republican establishment is powerful, but it's nowhere near what the Democratic establishment is. And people need to realize this because, you know, Joe Biden got like seven, eight percent in New Hampshire primary and he was like, seventh place or something like that and nancy pelosi was so spooked that bernie sanders was going to was going to become the nominee that she and james clyburn who's the number three guy in the house democrats went to, uh and he's from south carolina and he's he's a very powerful black uh democrat from south carolina and he went down there and he said look obama trusted biden we're going to trust him and biden went from like seven percent to like the winner overnight he won south carolina the rest was history and so they can do that they have the ability to kind of turn the mechanisms right and so you can imagine a scenario where you know who's ever in charge of the the white house right now it's obviously i'm saying obviously not biden i still think this is like obama's third term he's got his people in charge there and so you know obama's going to decide okay do we want to have kamala harris who's kind of you know, politically toxic because she did so terrible when she ran for president, or do we just push them uh, aside and let it be an open field, or do they just handpick California Governor Gavin Newsom and then he becomes the guy who's the nominee? So, I mean, whatever the to me, it's not going to be that the Democratic voters are going to decide. I know, I mean, technically they do, but really, it's going to be the establishment who says this is the person you need to vote for. Okay, and I thought to myself, you know. You know, they're going to obviously go with somebody like, you know, I thought after Hillary, like, are they going to go for a woman or are they going to go for somebody who's, you know, the first, you know, I don't know, Hispanic president or something like that. Like, no, 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 no. They picked Joe Biden. They wanted, they wanted the, they were, they were willing to lose rather than to have Bernie Sanders as the nominee. That was worse for them. It blows my mind. But. So you're saying there will be no populist uprising in the Democratic Party for they, this? No, uh, I mean, that's what, <laughs> said, that's what they said about the Trump. The percentage of Democratic voters who are appreciative of the Democratic machine is very, very high. I mean, they're, they're you know, there's there that's are people in the point. Democratic Party who don't like the establishment, but there's a lot of them that do. They go along with it. The, so, so if I could ask you then, do you think there's more Republican voters that are m dissatisfied with the establishment than there are Democrat voters that are dis dissatisfied? Yeah, that's an obvious. <laughs> and, and if you say, if so, you don't think there's any like wiggle room for people that maybe were previously Democrat? Do you think they've just switched over to Republican, or you don't think there's or that they middle vote ground independent Democrat? or they stay home? I mean, there's. I mean, this is the thing that people need to understand. Like, if somebody decides, oh, I've had it with you know the Democratic Party, your only option is to vote Republican. No, they stay home. They vote. They you know, they vote protest vote. They vote for Democrats on other things, but not for president. I mean, like, for example, I live in Michigan and Hillary Clinton should have, by all measures, defeated Donald Trump in 2016 in Michigan. He ended up winning by 10,000 votes. I mean, that's a very slim vote when you're talking about, you know, millions of voters in Michigan. And the, 
at the end of the day, what happened was there was enough Democrats who came out and they voted and they voted Democrats up and down the line. But at the top, they left it blank. More than 10,000 Democrats voted and left it blank. If they would, if you'd have pulled them aside and said, hey, by the way, Donald Trump's going to be president if you don't. I mean, it turns out that he won by more than just Michigan. But yeah, no, I mean, it. there's there. Democratic voters tend to be a little bit more. Well, not it tend to be a little bit more. They are definitely more pro-establishment than Republican voters. That doesn't mean that there isn't a dissent in the Democrats. It's just smaller. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting because I, I know growing up, it was like, I think among my parents' generation, Democrats are like with the worker, you know, the sticking it to the man. But times have changed. That's what he was saying about his, his dad, Bobby Kennedy, was he built he built his following on Catholics. He targeted Catholics specifically the poor, uh, minorities, and he had a ton of momentum going into the point where he unfortunately was assassinated. But the, he spoke very fondly of that. And, and my question in my head was, I was like, well, it, does that still exist? And, and I, I honestly don't, I don't think well, that Well, if you look at the, de- at the numbers now, the, the percentage of working class voters who are white, they've all come, not all of them, but they, they now vote Republican. But it's not just whites. Like this is the point that, um, uh, Ro- uh, gosh, Roy Texier, I can never say his name right. He wrote the book, What's the Wrong with Kansas? And he, his point is that working class voters, not just whites, but like blacks and Hispanics now are starting to come over and vote Republican. I mean, granted, it, the numbers are smaller for, let's say, blacks, but then Hispanics is much more. And so uh, we're seeing it. The You know, the working class is voting Republican. And unfortunately, you know, well, the way politics works is that you have senators in there who are in office for, you know, 40, 30, 40 years. And so they got elected in the 1980s when the coalition was like this, and now they're having to make adjustments. And so um, Uh. some Republicans are like, you know, what, we should be, we should be good to workers? I don't understand that. (laughs) Because they're so used to being (laughs) pro-business. It's like, guys, wake up. Uh, You should always be... (laughs) (laughs) That's so... doesn't mean you have to do socialism, but, you know, Yeah, that's so interesting that... I didn't think about, well, of course, like I, I'm just kind of tired of 80 year olds running the country. That's, that's my critique with both sides. It's like, why are we putting up these well, 80 year olds? I, I, I the sometimes country? flirt mm-hmm. with this idea online, whether or not we should have an amendment to the constitution that says 80 is enough. You know, like we have a minimum age requirement. You have to be 25 years old to serve in the house, 30 to, years old to serve in the Senate, 35 to be the, uh, the president. And that seems arbitrary. Yeah. Well, why not have uh, an you know, instead of a minimum, why don't you have a maximum? Yeah, forced once retirement. You're 80 years, once you're 80 years old, you can't serve in the House, Senate, White House, or the Supreme Court. Yeah, you have I to can go get behind retire that. and spend time with your children. So that kind of leads and us to- And honestly, one of the things you could do with it <laughs> is you could, could grandfather- You ruin the transition. You could gran- <laughs> but you could grandfather everyone in. I mean, in other words, anyone who's there in those positions could stay until they croak. But then once they get replaced, no, you can't do it anymore. It'd be, it'd be helpful. I'm behind that. Yeah, I'll I go agree. for that. Uh, but our resident, uh, almost eight year old, is he eighty? Joe Biden, I think he's. He is. A, yeah, he turned eighty. Yeah. Okay, November. Happy birthday! Yeah. He turned eighty. Uh, so we're talking about <laughs> his son, Hunter Biden. Was actually he just pled guilty uh, for some charges, and this felt like a long time coming because there's been a lot of controversy surrounding him in terms of the laptop. A lot of his illegal uh, business dealings and then also his personal life is kind of marred with uh, substance abuse and things like that. So, uh, Erica, what exactly was he charged of? And uh, do you think this was kind of a soft charge? Hmm. Yeah, I'll go through the facts first. So Biden is uh, he is going to plead guilty to two misdemeanors. And these were uh, failure to pay his federal taxes for two years, 2017, 2018. And it's a total of about a million dollars in federal taxes. So it's not a small amount, but he's, he's pleading guilty, um, but he's not going as a part of this deal. He will not plead guilty. He will admit to the wrongdoing, but he won't have to plead guilty to the felony charge of um, lying on a gun purchase form in 2018. The irony, of course, being that his dad right now is campaigning on major gun control, take the guns away from everybody else. Meanwhile, his son in 2018 lied. Uh, the question is, are you currently using illegal drugs like cocaine crack? And 
while Hunter was actually using these drugs. He admittedly was using them. He said, no, I am not. He got the gun, which subsequently his then girlfriend threw in a dumpster next to a high school, which is also illegal. I mean, the whole story, it, it's just like clown world <laughs> happening right in front of your eyes. But he's, he doesn't have to plead guilty. He admits to the wrongdoing in terms of the gun charge. Um, the charge is going to remain pending while he proceeds through a, quote, diversion program. Um, and as long as he complies with the terms of that program, prosecutors will eventually drop the felony charge. So none of this, none of the plea deal touches on the laptop or the Ukraine bribe rumors or the $10 million he got from some foreign national while his dad was vice president. Um, but the, the news here, of course, was that Hunter Biden admitting to these particular wrongdoings and essentially getting off with a slap on the wrist. Um, so a diversion program, for those of you who are wondering, what is this thing he has to do? Uh, it, it's essentially, it's a form of pretrial sentencing, and it's intended to help remedy the behavior that led to the charges. So you're thinking about things like drug rehab, education, community service, Remedying Originally not diversion. paying taxes? Like, do they teach him how to fill out a tax form? Or? I'm not sure about what exactly he's... Maybe he has to sit down with, you know, his CPA with for CPA. a certain number of hours. Yeah, commu community service from Hunter, not sure I want that. But yeah, so a, a lot of these programs are targeted, of course, at juvenile, uh, you know, detainees who um, they're trying to re-educate these young men and girls who are, um, you know, they're... They're in drugs, they're in gangs, they're in cartels, and it's trying to help them so they don't have to go to prison for the rest of their lives based on something they do when they're 16. Hunter, of course, is 53. So one wonders so literally if kid it's gloves. applicable. That's the definition yeah, of kid it's gloves. It's kind of literal kid gloves. Meanwhile, in the rap world, we're getting some major pushback from some oh. uh, maybe B-level rappers. This dude named Kodak, Kodak Black. Black. Yes. Kodak I'm Black, yes. Kodak Black, his up Kodak. lawyer is angry. He's <laughs> mad about the Hunter Biden news because Kodak was charged for the same crimes of evading taxes. And he had to go to jail for three years. I never so, thought in a million years that the name yeah. Kodak Black would come up in the loop cast from Erica Ahern. Well, this there is you a go. day to history remember. Is, history is being made thanks to Hunter Biden yet again. I mean, I got to say, the Hunter, <laughs> that is amazing. Hunter Biden. Wow. I, it's just, it's kind of sad. It's a surprising fall from grace from a top energy Ukrainian executive. I, I just couldn't <laughs> imagine. Yeah, I couldn't see this one coming. The whole thing is so gross. Yeah. I mean, it is. It yeah. is so gross. Kodak spent yeah. three years in jail for doing the same stuff. And we're talking about, yeah. So, okay, regardless. Yeah, so but was, was Kodak Black and, you know, was he a Ukrainian energy executive? He was expert? not. He was a Florida mm -hmm. rapper. Right. Kodak was not. Yeah. For a Florida rapper. Uh, yeah, not the same vibes. But uh, anyway, so, okay, so this just seems like such Apparently, a small... Kodak Black didn't save 10% for the big guy. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't great at taxes either um oh, so josh can i can i ask then um clearly like this is such a small percentage of a lot of his very public wrongdoings is this like is the intention of this to just get republicans off his back for like saying oh you got him you know you indicted him for something like well i don't understand this like why is this happening now why is it such a small piece of the pie what, was there a deal made i, I don't get it yeah i mean you know people come up with ideas for what they think the theories are. Like conservative pundit and scholar Jesse Kelly said that this, this was just the deal that, um, that, that Biden made to get his son a you know, sweetheart deal and that he would step aside and let someone else run uh, for president on the Democratic side. I mean, you know, all these, con who knows what, you know, there's all sorts of conjecture. But the big thing I have with this is that, you know, some people call it a two-tier justice system. Some people... But I like to say it's not hypocrisy that you use kid gloves on Hunter Biden and you throw the book at Donald Trump. Let's say they're both guilty, okay? Maybe they are. Well, shouldn't the law be tough with both? Or should they be compassionate for both? Why would it be soft on Democrats and then hard on Republicans? That's not hypocrisy. That's a hierarchy. And that's what we really need to investigate when it comes to, you know, we're just beginning on some of these things with the weaponization of the Federal Government Committee in the House. Uh, we got to continue that kind of stuff. Find out why it is that Hunter Biden gets a slap on the wrist and, you know, if Republicans do something wrong, they get the book thrown at them.
Yeah, and I thought it was interesting too coming out the statement that Biden's lawyer made coming out of the the court. Um, he said it's over now. Like he he just said, okay, now it's over. Everything with Hunter, put it away, lock it up. It's all done. Wrap it up. Wrap That's it up, people. Foul. Wrap yeah. it up. Moving on. Um, and then the prosecutor's office came right back like five minutes later and said, this yeah. investigation is ongoing. <laughs> and so it's clearly, this is, this is clearly a little bit of, um, so gross. You know, they're, they're not, they're two ships in the night here going on. So <laughs> it, it, this is not the last that we have heard of Hunter Biden. And of course, his father just last week said, you know, Hunter is one of the most intelligent people I know. He's done nothing wrong. Etc. And, uh, you know, at this point, not sure if Joe Biden is quite completely aware of what's going on with Hunter, but God that kind queen. of language isn't going to hurt him. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you watch CNN, you watch MSNBC, and all their comments are about how horrible it is that Republicans are using this story as an excuse for dredging up all of these baseless claims about Biden's laptop again. Like, I, I'm like, <laughs> that's just... just it's Again, just, you just have to dare imagine. How you notice that this is sketchy? If, if you know, like Eric Trump, which would be Donald Trump's kid. I thought you if said Eric Trump. Anything... I was like, who's that? No, or Eric, Eric yeah. Trump. If Eric, if Eric Trump had a laptop <laughs> and, and bought a gun and lied about dr drugs and all this kind of stuff, I'm sure MSNBC would not really hmm. cover it at all. Yeah, they'd, they'd right? ignore it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's no like, it's the decent thing to do. <laughs> yeah, right, right. If Barron, dude, I love seeing Barron at the White mm. House. He's so oh, tall. Oh, Barron. He got he big. He was so cute when they were in office. Anyway, this is shaping up to yeah, be one of my like favorite episodes. Feet while his, his dad was present. <laughs> this is definitely shaping up to be one of my favorite episodes so far. Oh, you're welcome, Poco. So, uh, next, <laughs> Kodak we have Black. the, <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, the Dodgers. So, uh, we're not done with the Dodgers. Um, we had the, officially the uh, event outside of the stadium has happened. Uh, our ad has now been seen over three and a half million times. Uh, the people uh, who uh, have... Uh, 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 oh, back it up. We need to update on. your numbers. What? I mean, that we did, uh, we did on online advertising. Yes. But in LA, we were on TV. I got a report back. It's been viewed. It was viewed 18 million times. Yeah, damn. I mean, we we were we were guns ablaze on this it's ad, a, so it was great. It's a sweet. I mean, it's a sweet ad too. Yeah, I the as soon as I saw it, I thought too, it was really well done. The thing about the ad, I thought was really good, and it was not me who did this. Okay, but um, to understand the, the the appeal of the ad, because we we looked on, you know, when someone's in front of their TV and the ad comes on, they, you know, they can't help but watch it. Or, or right. But when you're when you're watching it, on, so when it was on TV, people had to see it. But when we did the online ads, we got three million views on it, and we watched it. You know, you can tell. You know, get behind the scenes, and YouTube gives you all the statistics. And it was ninety one percent of the people watched a full fifty five seconds of this ad. They, I mean, in other words, everyone could not help but watch it. Right? Perspective. Because it felt like the beginning of like a ESPN thirty for thirty, and people were like, "Oh, this is amazing! This is great!" Yeah, and mm -hmm. so. Very effective ad, and it, we didn't like, you know, it wasn't a traditional political attack ad where we just, Dodgers stink. Like, no, right. no, no, no. Like, look, the Dodgers have a great history, and they did a lot of awesome things, like breaking the color barrier. Jackie Robinson. Why would they do all these great things and then support an anti-Catholic group? And so, you know, you want to appeal to the fan base and what they like. And, you know, they love their team and they just can't believe that they would do something this anti-Catholic. So I think that's why the the ad really hit it home for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and we have a few updates from what happened. So er, the, they decided to go ahead with honoring the uh, SPI and it was done before the game. They were awarded super briefly. I mean, I, I can link the video in here. It was a really the stadium was empty. They did it before the game, and they said they were concerned for safety or whatever. So they, it, it almost felt like they were a little bit embarrassed that they were still doing it. So they just got it over uh, yeah, really definitely. quick. Yeah, let's get this out of the way. <laughs> and there was a massive peaceful protest outside of Dodger Stadium a few hours before the game was set to begin. We had things like praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet, Litany of the Sacred Heart. Uh, some protesters waved Vatican flags, held signs bearing the words, Long Live Christ the King. Uh, and it was just so cool to see. It, it, was, it was just... a a really beautiful coming together of not just Catholics, but also people were just frustrated that that's, this was even happening, that we need, even needed to do this. But it ended up being very happy and very peaceful, which was awesome. We love to hear that. And uh, 
God also was watching the Dodgers suffered their worst home loss since the 1800s, late 1800s, lost 15 to nothing to the Giants. Uh, they are currently on a losing streak. And yeah, you know, something. When they invited you know, the sisters, so called sisters of perpetual indulgence, back in May, they were in first place. Now they're in third place. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll be take watching. That for what you will. No. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say to you, like it was, it was neat talking to Val- Tommy Valentine, who who really you know spearheaded a lot of our efforts here. So shout out to Tommy, uh, who's on staff here at Catholic Vote. But he was at the the rally, and some of his notes that he sent over, it just struck me. It had a real March for Life vibe to it, right? Where you know you go to this this rally, and it's about it, it's protesting something very horrible that's happening. Obviously, March for Life is protesting millions of abortions, so like horrible thing. But you go and the people who come, they're really there because they love life and they love the truths of the faith. And and from his descriptions and his notes, he's saying, you know, the overwhelming, uh, you know, feeling from this protest wasn't protest so much as people coming with their images of the sacred heart, people coming with their images of the blessed mother and saying, we love our Lord and we love our lady and you must not mock them. And it was more of this standing strong in joy and confidence of the faith than this angry, like, we're a bunch of prudes and we don't like people dressing in drag and you're going to hell. And and I'm sure there's some of that. There always is, you know, at these things. But the overwhelming was this positive, Jesus Christ is king and we love him and we are standing here with him. So it really neat account to listen to. I, if you if you have any um, any stories from that, if you have pictures from that, we're still collecting yeah, them. Send them, so in. send them in. For sure. And I don't think I can sum it up any better than that. So we move on to the next segment. We have Dobbs anniversary. So the Dobbs decision happened one year ago. And Woo! since then, the fight has kind of moved to the States in a lot of ways. And the questions are kind of going on around now is what's the path forward for the pro-life movement, for its involvement in politics? Different candidates have kind of given different answers as to what they think is there a place for this issue at the federal level? Should it all be handled at the state level? And, uh, you know, we, we have somewhat of a political wonk on, on, on the podcast, thankfully. Uh, Josh, is there, is there a path forward for a candidate for president to make a case for federal involvement for the abortion question? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the 14th Amendment says that we all have the right to life, liberty, and property. So, like, if you know, if a state doesn't have the back of the citizens, and if a state doesn't recognize your right to life, then that's a problem with the 14th Amendment. And how could it be? I mean, how, how you're not free if, if we don't have uh, the right to life. And so it might take a while, but we're going to fight for the right to life in all states. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, people get this idea that, oh, well, now that Roe v. Wade's over and Dobbs got through, we're, we're just going to kick it all to the states. What the what Dobbs did is it allowed states to protect unborn children. It didn't prevent the federal government from protecting unborn children. <laughs> it just got rid of a horrible, horrible Roe v. Wade law, so called law, that prevented states from protecting their own uh, their own citizens. So, um, you know, I still think we need to fight. Uh, on a federal level, the biggest thing is like let's stop our federal government from um, paying for abortions. Like that's the worst thing. And so we've had the Hyde Amendment, which is it, it it has the force of federal law, but it's just a what's called a rider. It's just an added to appropriations bill every year they're passed. But what we'd like is stronger than that, so we don't have to fight that every year. An actual law, no taxpayer for fu- funding for abortion act. And the thing is, the Republican leadership in the House promised back in February that they would have a vote on this, and they haven't done it yet. And so we call on the House Republicans to stay true to their word and have a vote on this. This would be a great week to do it because, you know, we got the whole Dobbs anniversary. So let's go, guys. Let's have this vote. And if you support, I mean, it, it, there are some people, some Republicans who don't want, okay, this is now kicked in the states. We don't need to do this anymore. Well, if, if even if you think that, okay, and you don't want the federal government to do anything, that would mean having the federal government stop paying for abortions. Well, that, is, of course, that's something that um, majority of Americans support anyway, that tax Of course, it's like 70, 80%. I mean, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It just seems like a no-brainer. Like, even if you personally, 
would wouldn't mind getting an abortion most people agree that taxpayer money shouldn't be used to do it that's a Absolutely. right majority like they keep saying this is between me and my doctor uh, oh and your and apparently um the taxpayer's wallet i mean it's just like so baloney <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And another another area in which a presidential candidate can really push is cleaning up the cleaning up our military, our armed forces and all the branches, including including the Coast Guard, which is not in the Department of Defense. But the president is the commander in chief. And um, ha there is definitely you know, that's something the states can't do is stop this abortion tourism movement in our armed forces. We're going to send our military members across state lines to get abortions. Um, you know, and pay for it. And it, it's tied to the Hyde Amendment, like like Josh said. But that's another area where the Biden administration has just used the, the military to push its radical abortion agenda. And a future president could could be reeling that back in. I was talking just, to our... Just... Oh, go oh. The Coast Guard is part of the, the military. It is part of the military, but it's not under the Department of Defense. It's under Homeland Security. So people saw... It is that is. true? Oh, it's under it both. is. It's under both. Mm. Oh, okay. we might we'll need a real-time we'll fact, fact check. check on that one. Yeah. Ooh, we're going for that. Go for it, Pogo. Do me a Google. <laughs> I kind of no. love that. Dude, I will keep going, um, Eric. I'm Googling it right now. All right, you go Google that. So It's just that during, you're right, though, under in Whoa. wartime, it's under, under, <laughs> under wartime. Right? it's under The magic I said it's under. I said both. And it's during peacetime, <laughs> it's, it's under Homeland Security. During war, it's under the uh, defense. Okay, okay. okay. All right, good distinctions. I'll forego my Google. Thank distinctions you for Distinctions were made. Civic, yeah. That's like Civics 202. That's not even Civics 101 with Josh. That's Civics 202. That was a concession right just letting you know. Getting up um, to the sophomore well, level. Well, okay, so one, one of the things that I've heard, actually, uh, to your point, Erica, one, people have come to me and they'll talk about some interviews that we do that they like. And one of the ones that keeps coming up, which was a short interview, but a cool one that you did, it was when we talked to the senator from Alabama, Tommy mm -hmm, Tuberville. Senator Tuberville. That and was a great one. That was fun. It, it was just something that I think a lot of people didn't know was happening it was kind of low-key and you he gets attacked for it from time to time but to my knowledge still holding up all promotions nominations until you know they stop using abortion funds for yep, travel still so at like, it. that is a real principled stand that i think a lot of people are inspired by and it's like it's what they'd want their elected representatives to do if they mm -hmm. elect them you know so absolutely cool go yeah, check that really one out one. so yeah shout out to uh Man, there's so many things I could talk about since Dobbs dropped. I mean, the day it dropped was just like it felt like I was going to be at the March for the Life for the rest of my life. And it's still going on, of course. But um, well, now there's a, there's a celebration of life on the mm -hmm. Dobbs anniversary. You're so headed I'm taking, to that, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm taking two of my boys over there. We're going to celebrate. Nice. That's cool. It's going to be a great yeah, day. Be fun. So if you're in D.C., I'll see you Saturday. There you go. Hi. You can see Mercer That's and awesome. ask him all the political questions you want. Specifically <laughs> involving uh, jurisdiction of the Department of Defense, if you really want to push them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. well, and of course, coming out of the Dobbs decision, we have to mention just the number of lives that have been saved. Um, five five thirty eight, which is no friend to the pro life movement. Uh, they were fretting this week. Uh, of course, they're commemorating Dobbs that anniversary as a great tragedy for the American people. But five thirty eight ha is estimating that um, over twenty four thousand. Uh, there have been twenty four thousand fewer legal abortions uh, since July 2022 uh, as a result, direct result of the Dobbs decision. Um, and, and of course, those are babies that are alive today. That's 24,000 people who are going to have a life um, and everything that goes with that. So uh, that's the greatest legacy, right, of Dobbs. And we can't wait to see that number uptick as the years <laughs> go by. I mean, the thing is with the with the, when the laws changed like that, there were obviously some people who did fly to other states in order to abort their child. So that what that means, they factored that in though, and that's they still yeah. twenty four thousand heartbeats, people breathing because of the pro life laws. So don't let anyone tell you, oh, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Voting doesn't Didn't matter. Didn't do anything. Twenty four thousand people are alive yeah. because of this. That's pretty yeah. awesome. It is. That is pretty awesome. Yeah. So we move in the twilight zone now, Erica. You're up first. I'm up first. Well, going back to our COVID saga, I just want to update everyone. COVID patient zero has been found. The first human being uh, has been identified. And I just have to throw this in there. Sorry, dad joke from a mom. Who had it first? Who had it first? A man named Dr. Who in the Wuhan lab of virology was in fact patient zero. And what was Dr. Who? 
oh my gosh, there's so many puns I could be making, but I'll stop. What was Doctor was, Who doing who in first? Wuhan? Who's on first? Who's on first? What was he doing? He was doing gain of function research funded by the United States of America. Michael Schellenberger, Matt Taibbi, and Alex Gutentag turned up new evidence that the COVID virus was created in a Wuhan lab and escaped and first infected a researcher we were paying, we being the Americans. The Wall Street That's Journal great. confirmed the story this week, and off we go to the races. In fact, all those conspiracy theories weren't just conspiracy theories after all. So it was a true twilight zone in the COVID unmasking. No, you know, the conspiracy theorist thing, that's like a perfect bookend on this, okay? So um, with, the, with the RFK Jr. stuff at the beginning of the episode. So here's, here's sort of my take. This one comedian, he said it much more colorfully than I will. When he talks about conspiracy theories, he goes, do y'all believe in conspiracy theories? I'm like, no one? None? Do you believe? He, and he, he just had a great way of saying it. He goes, like, he... The federal government, you think the federal government's batting a thousand, that it never lies to the American people about anything? <laughs> and I just thought that was so perfect. He goes, because I am a kid and I lie to him every day. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, people oh. just you know, I mean, understand. I, the, I'd laugh. You stretch the truth. It was, it was, you know, a, whatever, it was da, a joke. It was you a know, joke. Distract yeah. your kids. Yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> but the thing yeah. is, I don't I laugh if it didn't make I, me so mad. Let's put it that <laughs> way. I don't, I don't, I certainly don't believe every conspiracy theory ever. I mean, and I and I'm not much of a guy in this. Like I believe we landed on the moon. Okay, <laughs> I'm going with the moon. Yeah, I, I'm yeah, a round I, earther. I, I even believe I, the earth I, is I, round. I, I do. You're really going to bring this one up? Why was the flag not waving? That's that's all I got to say. <laughs> I think that there's, there's, there's no atmosphere, bro. Come on, right, there's, there's, there's no a case. wind. On there's the a moon. case. No. Well, no, the there's flag no was waving. That was the conspiracy. But so you, you can't bring up these theories with me. Well, all I got to say on conspiracy theories, I don't even like the name conspiracy theory because it just reads to me as slander against people that you don't want to be right. There's the truth and there's falsities. There's not the truth. Anytime, everything's a conspiracy theory until it's proven true or it's, or it's false. But like, if you choose sure. not to engage with these people and just slander them, censor them, whatever, all you're going to do that is make them more mad, make them more extreme. And that's the problem that's, that's my biggest problem, with RFK right, Jr. Is, is, is the censorship and the slander and the bullying tactics. It's, it's just confront people when they, when they have these, you know, theories that you think are baloney. Confront them and refute them. Because With evidence. if you don't, right. yes, yeah. if you don't, then once, once, it gets, once it finally breaks through and the truth comes out about something and people find out you're lying, then they're going to think you lied about everything. When, in fact, maybe you did or maybe you didn't. But this is what... Be you start to have a breakdown in trust in civil, you know, in civic institutions. Now, I would say a lot of the mistrust at this point is earned. We should have more mistrust because uh, there earned. is a lot of this baloney. It's our government, people. This is our country. We need to get people in there that are going to shake things up and get rid of people who use these bullying tactics and censorship stuff. Just give it to us straight. The administration... Right, Go, go ahead, Erica. I could. I was just going to say, and the problem is, it's not like we haven't seen this happen in history before. It's not like we're like, gosh, I wonder what happens when trust in civic institutions breaks down completely, right? And it is, Josh, it's, it's recognizing that these are our institutions, this is our country, and it's, it, it's grabbing onto it and taking it back. When we don't do that, when we just give up and say, well, what the heck, you know, oh, well, we get things like the Bolshevik Revolution and we get things like the brown shirts coming up in Germany in the 1930s. And we, we get things like the total breakdown of, of society that we saw in Vietnam and in Saigon. And, and so it's, it's, it's really important that we not just give up and that we, we come back and we take back our institutions. So anyway, that's my like impassioned plea to please get politically active Catholics. Yeah. So if if I were even to focus just on this issue that the lab leak theory, quote unquote, anyone who believed that was a conspiracy theorist, I thought for sure it came from a lab. The Biden administration and all the people in that in the cabinet labeled over half the country, I'd say, as a conspiracy theorist, as a domestic terrorist, yada, yada, yada. And for anyone that is wondering why people are so frustrated with the Biden administration, it's because of this language that's used to describe anyone that disagrees with the priorities of the administration. Uh, MAGA extremists, domestic terrorists, white supremacists, like you're just rationing it up to the worst of the worst. And how do you expect anyone to like 
come to the table, have honest discussion, discussion, have any type of trust with you if you're just going to to label them and dismiss them from society. So, I mean, I of course this came from a lab. This the, someone ate a bat. Like that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> Some ate a bat. to be called crazy by leadership, people that are in charge of public health for three years to now just have this happen. And where's the apology people? I haven't heard any apology from anyone who slandered me for the past three years for anyone that believed in natural immunity. So that's why the RFK junior problem is self-created because, yeah. he, because previously he was labeled as a conspiracy theorist, which I disagree with personally. But I was labeled a conspiracy theorist for believing that this was in a lab. We're all in the same boat now. Half the country's in that boat now. So you're wondering why this guy's blowing up. You're wondering By the way, why it's Joe funny Rogan's on the, on the uh, specifically on the origin coming in a lab. The the funniest part about that is when they dragged out John Stewart on you know oh Colbert's CBS oh show. Oh my and, gosh! And Pathetic. it was this routine where he's like. Oh, do you think it could have been the bat? Or maybe the lab that's in yeah. Wuhan? And I was like, to me, I just laughed at this because this is like, this was the establishment realizing that they needed to use a little humor and say, it's okay mm -hmm. to believe this now. I mean, these guys are so, the stenographers for this regime, it's just, and it John, was John Stewart was the only person to have RFK Jr. on to talk about vaccines. It's and true. that was that was yanked in like a day. I think it was like five days before that was pulled off forever. And he had to publicly apologize for having him on or whatever. I think I think it's all super fishy, but that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm going to move on to other problems with trust. So um, for my Twilight Zone, I mean, this is just, as soon as I saw this, some things are just made for the Twilight Zone. Uh, so there's a restaurant in California, and this, this actually, you know, relates to us directly as Catholics. So many of us Catholics, we appreciate the sacrament of confession. Uh, and I do. And there was a restaurant in California that brought in a fake priest to hear confessions from employees. And this priest, strangely, was asking very specific questions about, you know, have you stolen food? Uh, have you driven drunk? Uh, asked a lot of very specific questions during confession. Job I don't know related. about you. Yeah. I, I haven't had question. a priest ask me questions <laughs> during uh, confession. And this was during work hours. So during work hours and, quote, get the sins out. And uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, restaurant was caught and ordered. They had to pay workers one hundred forty thousand dollars. But I mean, I gotta I, say, oh man, there. I mean, <laughs> I gotta say this. I I fear honestly for the soul of the of the the whoever manager of that, that restaurant. Yeah. Whoever did this, whoever did I have that. to say, like, dude, you need you you're the one that needs to go to confession now because you play around like that and you and. You try to act like you're God, and you are cruising for an eternal bruising. You got to get it figured out. That it actually is kind of chilling, you know, to think about that. Someone would that was that is a wicked sin. That is a yeah, wicked, wicked sin. It really sin. threw me back. It threw me back to the interview with um, the exorcist priest, Father Martins. I was because he talks about activities and playing around with religion and mocking as as these openings to demonic activity and, and it's just I read this and I was like oh you don't play around with the sacrament of confession that is not not a game you want to play so yeah I'm with you Josh get, get the yeah, two a nunnery get the two the a book priest at them. That's, <laughs> that's not even I mean so the restaurant denied employees overtime pay managers were paid bonuses from the employee tip pool and some employees face adverse immigration consequences for cooperating with investigators so there's a whole element of this too of cooperating, well, of targeting people who are Hispanic who were Catholic. Right. Yeah, they're and, targeting Hispanics and using employment right. status is like it's. Uh, I know people who work in service it, industry. It, like it's 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 spiritual exploitation and mm -hmm. it's actual working exploitation. And our our Lord will not be kindly upon this because the there's several times in the Bible where you know Jesus admonishes people who. Uh, abuse people uh, for work, you know, work taking advantage of their labor. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible sin. Yeah. So it's it's something horrible. about a millstone too. Remember that verse. Vipers. Just kind of like this almost feels like it's mm -hmm. a like a, it could be like a sketch, like a like a comedy sketch, and then like literally some things are stranger than fiction. Like I don't even know if someone would even thought this up to put in. I don't know, like a Keen Peel or something like that. <laughs> I expect I just, it to be a Law and Order episode right? within a year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, it will be picked up for sure. Scriptwriters are watching. Uh, Josh, your twad zone. 
I mean, this is Twilight Zone. This is crazy. Um, the ACLU is upset. Well, what a shock there, right? Mm, they're always the, upset. They said, the state of Florida, this is what they say, the state of Florida never provided medically necessary gender-affirming care to Dwayne Owen, causing her enormous suffering and violating her right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment for more than 30 years while she was in state custody. For the audio okay. listeners, there was air quotes on the her. Yeah. yeah. Dwayne Owen is a murderer. He murdered somebody and then performed unspeakable acts against the body. And then we're talking about a minor after death. This is a, this is a guy who's committed horrible offenses back in 1984 and in 1986. And because our laws are so, you know, so crazy when it comes to capital punishment, he finally was executed in 2023. But, you know, it's like, it, it, I know some people don't like the death penalty. I don't know why it should take 40 years to, to, to happen, but the, I'm not getting into the debate on the, the death penalty <laughs> here. What I'm trying to say is the ACLU thinks a, a murderer and a rapist deserves a right to gender-affirming care, have taxpayers spend money to transition this person to another sex. It's like, wait a minute. This person murdered somebody, and you're going to... You're going to ask the taxpayers to pay for them to change their sex? I mean, aside the, for the fact that, like, why would you do it because the guy's on death row anyway? But that's another story. The ACLU, you start to realize these people just want to burn everything down. They really do. They want, the, they want our country, they want it to just go to in the flames. They just want to see it on fire. It's so, just crazy. Josh, it's important for you to, because once again, not everyone is like internet people uh the the specific tweet from the aclu it's just a big graphic that said florida has executed Dwayne owen and then the text on it was the state of florida never provided medically necessary gender affirming care to Dwayne owen causing her um, enormous suffering and violating her right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment for more than 30 years she was in state custody with no mention to the crimes no mention. State like custody. Yeah. They just None. happened to have what? this guy here for 30 years. He was in custody. Maybe because he murdered people. <laughs> and then, uh, so of course, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, uh, community notes on Twitter, but they it's it's probably the closest I've seen to actual fact checking because it's community sourced, of course, because it's not necessarily politically motivated. So the community context was in eight, 1984, Owen murdered and raped both a 14-year-old girl and a 38-year-old mother. Owen's lawyers argued insanity. Psychiatrists for the state testified Owen faked schizophrenia and had no signs of gender dysphoria. His record, his records indicate he exhibits sexual sadism. Yeah, I mean this right. guy, like so. as far as the gender affirming care issue goes, like if they're talking about castration, that might be a perfectly appropriate punishment or penalty for someone, but that's obviously not what the ACLU had in mind. And yeah, like you said, Josh, they just want to burn it all down. Yeah, it's just disgusting. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a <laughs> that's a tough one to end on. I don't know if we have. I, I mean, <laughs> look, you asked dog. for you. Look, that at, was Twilight want, Zone. Give me kind something the from the Twilight Zone. Here, oh. I'll tell you this. I'll I'll tell you this. I want to end on a happy note because the whole thing about the Dodgers, okay? You know, and people are like, why? You know, here's the team. Here's a company that's honoring something that's so blasphemous and so vile. And then you look at the, what's going on in our country, and you look at what's going on in our church, and all these fights, and all these horrible things. And, it, and it's easy to kind of get a little discouraged about the, all these things. Uh, you know, how do you, what, what do you do? And I always like to think of myself as a happy warrior. My friend Joe Stong said, the trick is to put everything in proper perspective. Why must the good face seemingly overwhelming odds from the world, flesh, and the devil. Why must the good man feel like he's alone against an army that's encamped against him, against not just flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers? You know, we're talking intelligence vastly more powerful than humanity combined. Because the good man is a Christophori, 
He is a Christ bearer. If the odds were anything less, it wouldn't be a fair fight. And it is a fight because all of reality is a war between those who would do their own will and those who would do God's will. But ultimately, we are just creatures fighting against creatures. That was a bar. I love that. I actually took that, printed it, put it by my desk because that's awesome. I, there I you have, go. There you I go. Have, um, there you go, Tom. I will end on a high note. I have on my desk, uh, if the world hates you, know it hated me first. Um, mm-hmm. Also good but, one. So I, I like to also end on this. So <laughs> the Dodgers ad, we had someone comment under the Dodgers ad, at Catholic Vote, at Dodgers. Catholic Vote is one guy in a basement. He's a grifter <laughs> I love and that. you're suckers if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> How did they know this was my basement? Yeah, That's like it was a nice basement, Josh. <laughs> Come so, on. Uh, yeah. Catholic Con- congrats vote is one to guy the one guy who runs Catholic Vote from his basement. He's really been killing it lately. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that does it for this episode of the Loopcast. This was a fun one. Ways to help the program, as always. Leave us a review. I've seen some really good ones recently. Uh, if you can't get enough Loopcast, we have a bonus episode this week. And I don't even think I put bonus in the title because the I just the conversion story of Anna Kate was so incredible. It just almost deserved its own spot. It was a little bit longer of an interview, but um, trust me, it, it, I've never seen that level of vulnerability and honesty. We do a lot of interviews. That might be the first one I've seen where like someone went really deep and was just so generous in sharing her story and her thoughts and her future plans. So she uh, suffers from, uh, or she has same-sex attraction and uh, she completely changed her lifestyle is now con- um, pursuing uh the profession of becoming a theologian, Catholic theologian. So go check that one out if you can't get enough. I'm not going to give any more information on it. You just have to listen to it. It was incredible. Good job with that, Erica. And uh, if you want to talk to us, loopcast at catholicvote.org. I've been fielding some emails from you guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, if not, we'll see you next Thursday. Bye, guys.